Amber, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, good morning. This is really fantastic. We're sitting on a bunch of archives of media that will probably not be archived for that long because it's archived digitally. So we'll have to deal with that at some point in the future. I'd like to talk to you about calm technology. Um, who's heard this quote that 50 billion devices will be online by 2020? Hooray. So the issue is that we used to have many people to one computer. And then with desktop computers, we had a few people to one computer. And now we have mobile technologies. And now we have Internet of Things. And now there are devices outnumbering us. And what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you more about why I'm really interested in this. Usually when somebody says, here's a giant statistic that 50 billion devices will be online, I actually try to think, like, does this really sound good? Because oftentimes we have this future proposals where as long as we add more technology onto something, at some point everything will be perfect. All of our problems will be solved. Right? Do you think all of our problems have already been solved by technology, or are you just kind of annoyed with it and you kind of have to use it? So I think that will be amplified more in the future. So how do we design technology that doesn't get in our way constantly and cause us to be addicted to it? So when I say, does this sound good, I consider some of the devices that are already out there, like the smart watch that just gives you the same notifications that you have on your phone and just interrupts you all day where you have to actually manually set those notifications if you really want information that's useful. Or the smart fridge. There are a lot of futuristic companies that, rep that represent large clients that like to call me on the phone and say, can we make a smart fridge? And I usually say, why do you want to make a smart fridge? And they say, well, we want to keep people from eating sweets and junk food. I said, well, you usually keep those in a dumb cupboard. Why don't you make a smart cupboard to keep people out? But there's also issues where like, they want to do a fingerprint analysis to like, let you get into your fridge. Um, but if you're making food and your hands are dirty, you can't really get into the fridge. Or you have to call somebody up on the phone to get a new payment plan to add a new subscriber to your fridge in the household. And then there's Netflix on your fridge. And I really don't understand any of this because if I bought a house with all of these old technologies in it 10 years in the future, I would hate my life so much. Plus, the thing would beep at you all the time, and it wouldn't work if you didn't have the cert Anyway, the problem is that when you get all of these technologies together on different time cycles, with different <coughs> alert styles, in different programming languages, you get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future, in which everything is just beeping at you all the time. It's not making your life easier. It wasn't the promise of technology to make our life easier. What are we really optimizing for? Are we optimizing for on Facebook for more page views so it works to keep us depressed so that we click on more buttons? Or is it optimizing for ease of use? I don't know where these companies are optimizing for, but this is our future if we keep going at this point. And I don't want this future. We can prevent this future. Here's another example of Internet of Things gone wrong. There's this pet net company. The idea behind this company is that you could have an automated pet feeder, it will feed your pets, and then you can also Skype your pets if you want to see them, and so you can... Anyway, so the problem was that usually if you get an offline pet feeder, the pet feeder will just work every 10 hours it will feed your pet, or every five hours it will feed your pet, and you don't need to have it connected to the web. But this one was reliant on a remote server. So can you guess what happened? So the server for this company went down for three days. <laughs> and during this time, PetNet said, hey, uh, make sure you check on your pets, um, because we haven't implemented offline support for pet feeding. What was this optimizing for? The whole point was, feed your pets. On the front of the website, it said, never worry about feeding your pets again when you're gone, because we'll take care of it for you but then they didn't implement offline support. When an escalator breaks, it turns into stairs, right? Why did this not revert into a very simple feeding device on a schedule? So then I looked into this and I said, wait a second, isn't somebody suing somebody? Isn't, if, if like somebody's cat dies, isn't this a big issue? And furthermore, if humans are connected to this kind of system and they died, wouldn't that be a really big deal? So then I looked into the terms of service, 
and it said PetNet is not responsible for any service failures. So if your cats and pets and dogs die, it's not their fault. Even though they said on the front of the site that you didn't have to worry about feeding your pets. This is one example of our reliance on technology as if it's electricity. If we had electricity in here that was built like we have Wi-Fi, these lights would be going off and on all the time. It would be like, I'm sorry, too many people are trying to use the electricity. We're going to have to regulate it so the lights are kind of dim most of the time. You have to wait for the lights to load. It's like, sorry, we're getting the light information from the server. Are you kidding me? The problem is that we have connectivity in this really annoying, intermittent, interrupted way, and then we have electricity that's pretty standard and stable. Where an, an outage is not really a, you know, it's a big deal, but it doesn't happen very often. And last century, we had these electrification efforts where the biggest app was like a, a dishwashing machine and a washer and uh, all these, like a hairdryer, right? And we adopted all these technologies because you guarantee that you can plug them into the wall, they're standards, and they run. And now what do we have? We have something that may or may not connect. We have Netflix streaming that may or may not stream. We have Facebook. We have email that sometimes goes down. And now we have a bunch of Internet of Things devices like Wi-Fi routers that get taken over by hackers and used to make botnets that like attack part of the web. It's a really weird future. You can't even get homeowner's insurance. If you get homeowner's insurance for your kitchen uh, appliance like catching on fire, like it'll cover your house and maybe the house next to it if, if it burned <coughs> down. But you can't get this for Internet of Things devices because if an Internet of Things device gets hacked, it's going to attack some remote website or like cause a fire somewhere else. There's not a one-to-one -one cause of, of harm. So these are kind of the issues of, like, that we have to deal with right now because there's this kind of uncertain future. So we have an era of interruptive <laughs> technology. It's not just servers are getting interrupted and our connection to things, but the technology itself is interrupting us. How many of you have a love-hate relationship with your phone? Okay, so, and how many of you, your phone is the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning, even before your significant other? <laughs> and how many of you, your phone, fall asleep to your phone at night when you go to sleep? I'm glad you don't. I saw this like, okay, so a few of you. Um, so we have this era of interruptive technology where we often are taking care of our phones better than we take care of ourselves. Like we'll be like, oh, I don't need to eat, I'm, I'm on my phone, and then, oh, I gotta plug my phone in, and then you forget that like you're a human. Um, so what's the opposite of inter an interruptive technology? I was, I was writing my thesis in 2007 on mobile phones, which involved walking around, watching people watch their phones, and they don't even tell, they can't even tell that you're watching them. You just kind of like walk like this, and they're like, hmm, and then you can write about it. It was, it was great, it was a good time. But <laughs> I thought, what if, what if somebody has studied this before? And there were some people that studied it. They called it calm technology, the opposite of interruptive technology. And where this came from was these two people, Mark Weiser, who's no longer with us, and John Seeley Brown at Xerox Park. How many of you know about Xerox Park? Okay, so a few of you. Xerox Park is where we got a lot of printers, but we also got the graphic user interface, which was stolen by Steve Jobs. We got a Ethernet. We had a lot of things that were early technologies because this was a, a research think tank. And the thing is that these guys created a bunch of connected technology in the 90s, way before we had the Internet of Things. They were considered the fathers of ubiquitous computing, where technology is everywhere and devices outnumber people. And the main thing that they found, and they wrote some papers about this, is that when you have devices that outnumber people, the scarce resource is no longer technology, it's our attention and how those devices make use of our attention becomes the crucial thing to look at. Now, unfortunately, they created this system, they wrote all these papers, no one remembered them, no one cared, because they all got distracted by the internet, and now we have the internet of things, and everybody forgot the research. So it's been my kind of mode of operation to dig up the research and say, hey, now we can look at this, it was really well written in the 90s, and we can apply it to the world. So this whole talk is about taking the research and putting it into this generation where people need to use it. 
One of the quotes is, a good tool is invisible. By invisible, we mean the tool doesn't intrude on your consciousness. You focus on the task, not the tool. Um, so a lot of people talk about invisible interfaces, and I don't like the idea of an invisible interface. I like the idea of visualizing something that was formerly invisible so you can make a good decision, or thinking of a really good interface like a book. A book stays the same size and shape and content, even if you spill coffee on it. It loads instantaneously, you don't have to get any updates for it, and if the interface, the words, are written well enough, your brain dissolves into that book, and you end up caring about the characters in that book more than you even know or care about your next door neighbor. And that's a really powerful interface, but it's about the media on the interface and how that thing is built that can make it a calm technology. You don't walk into somebody's house and get hit by a wave of books and get really distracted. You look at the tiny little spines and you can actually like see a little bit about the person inside the house, but when you close that book, all of that complexity is wrapped up in that small container with just something on a spine. There's something to be said for that, that kind of technology, which it still is a technology. It used to be scrolls, and you had to scroll and scroll and scroll in, or in order to get to something. And then they said, let's cut up the scroll and bind it together, and suddenly we'll have a book. This is fascinating. So let's talk about designing calm technology. Um, the first principle is that technology shouldn't be requiring all of our attention, just some of it, and only when necessary. So when your phone keeps beeping at you about things that don't matter to you at all, that's bad technology. It's not that we're bad at technology. Technology is kind of bad at humans. It's not been, there hasn't been a lot of thought given to the information that's on our devices, and it's just keep sending messages. So a tea kettle is a good analog example of this. A tea kettle, you set it, you forget it, you go into another room, and it shouts at you when it's done, and then you can go and get it. It's a really boring example, but most everybody has a tea kettle in their house because it's really useful but you don't have to sit there watching it to make sure it's done. Technology should empower your peripheral attention. So right here, a lot of technology focuses on very high resolution attention right here, where that was the world of the desktop. The world is no longer a desktop. The world is not a desktop computer, and we can't expect people to sit in front of something, pay all of their attention to it, and download something that's really large. It, really, we have to make use of the other peripheral attention. We have low resolution attention around here, and around the back of our head we can hear things like tones and status updates. And so if we make use of that and we say, what doesn't necessarily need to be visual, but can be compressed into a sound or a buzz, then you can really give people more information, but these lower resolution alerts allow you to kind of attune to it, but not be completely distracted by it. The minute you give somebody a visual alert, or like a piece of text, they'll read the whole thing, especially if it's an email, and they'll get completely taken out of their task. This is the Lumoback Smart Posture Sensor. You wear it around your, you wear it around your waist, and then it notices when you slouch, and it buzzes you. Um, it's a pretty silly example, but it uses haptics. It uses touch to give you the information, which, unlike getting a Microsoft Outlook notification or like hearing one of those, it's it's really <coughs> nice because it's a personal notification. I had an employee that had an insulin pump, and he was really excited about get, getting a 24-hour insulin pump installed. You just have to fill it with insulin, and it will beep when you need to refill it. The problem is that he couldn't turn off the beep. So when he was in a movie, or when he was at a funeral or a wedding, he would be beeping if he forgot to fill this thing. And if he was at a really loud concert, he couldn't hear that he needed to fill the pump. And so he was really upset because he couldn't change the alert. And I think as we move into technologies that are going to be used in more contexts than a simple home environment in a perfectly structured room with a nice internet connection, we're going from that to really bad mobile connection, not necessarily being able to access content all of the time, and personal in a bunch of different situations. How we make those alerts and how we allow people to change those alerts will become really important. Technology should inform and in calm. This is a this is my old uh, kitchen. So this is a hue light bulb attached to a weather report. 
So when I wake up in the morning, instead of having a computer being like, good morning, Amber Case, how are you doing today? I hate those stupid computerized voices and these like perfect videos in which people can speak to the computer and have it understand them the first time. Who gets understood by a computer the first time anyway? It's like, it doesn't work like that. So with this, it just changes the color of the light bulb based on what the weather is going to be for the day. So if it's going to rain, I'll walk into my kitchen and it'll be blue. If it's going to be really hot, it will be like a bright red. If it's going to be sunny, it will be yellow. And so I've been living in Portland, Oregon for 11 years and it's pretty much the same weather as here. <laughs> so uh, every time you know, I'd wake up and I'd see like this hint of yellow, I'd be like, yes, it's going to be sunny. You know, and you can dance around. And then if you want to, you can look at the iPad conveniently installed on the wall, which will give you the actual detailed weather report. But the whole point is it's using your ambient awareness to feel the weather versus look at a weather report and see the weather. You could always dive into it, but it's not going to be the first thing waking you up in the morning. So it's the complete inverse of all these utopian videos, usually from Microsoft, which are about waking up in the morning and getting this computer to tell you everything, which is just, uh. technology should amplify the best of what technology can do and the best of what humans can do. Humans are really good at being embodied, as in having bodies and also having context and being curators. This is why a site like Google is so useful. Um, a site like Google is really useful because it takes a lot of information from a bunch of different sources and it takes all these little tiny robots and the little tiny search robots go out and categorize that information and when you do a search, it gives you information, 10 results, and you choose from those results what best fits what you need. It doesn't try to choose for you. And so every time you try to have something, a machine act like a human, like one of those voice call lines where it says, please tell me with your voice what your choice is instead of pressing a button, you end up being on pause. You end up acting more like a robot because you have to repeat yourself a lot of times. And the more automation we have, the more important customer service becomes. Because if you've ever, ever been stuck in like a parking garage where the ticket machine doesn't work, the first thing you want is a human to come by and say, please override the machine, I'm stuck in the parking lot and I can't get out. This is a horrible system, I hate it, and I'm so mad and I'm late. You know, there's all these like traps that people get into where we say, well, it'll just automate the whole system. But then we need to have the human backup to make sure that if we get stuck, we can get unstuck. Because the minute a machine <coughs> makes all the decisions for us, then we don't have any choice. Like machines aren't necessarily friendly, they're just rule-based. And even if you program with some friendly uh, text, they're still not friendly, they're still <laughs> not human, they're still not cozy. And so we have to say, do we want a world in which machines do everything for us and get it wrong a lot of the time, especially if you're lower class instead of upper class? Or do we want to have technology that works alongside us, that helps us and informs us and helps us make better decisions. And I think that kind of technology is more resilient because there's still humans in the loop. And every time we've seen technology that tries to automate everything, we get into a lot of trouble and we get movies like War Games, which I encourage all of you to watch. This is, this is my friend Todd Huffman. Five years ago he said, I want to make a computer that scans for cancer. And I said, great. So he said, well, the problem is you get these two-dimensional tissue samples and it takes a year and a half for somebody to, uh, like a, a grad student, a doctoral student, somebody who should be doing much different work. Uh, it takes them a long time to actually take the sample in two dimensions, prepare the slide, and then scan it. <laughs> it just takes a really, really long time. And then after a while, maybe five years, they can't do it anymore because their eyesight goes bad and their <coughs> hands have repetitive stress disorder. This is really an inhuman task, inhumane task. So this type of task is really great to roboticize because you don't want a human to do that. A human is acting like a robot. So what if, he said, I made a machine that took three-dimensional biopsy samples and then used a diamond knife to both cut and scan each layer at a time and do it 1,500 times faster than a human can do it. Then it automates that task for a person and frees up a human to do something like interpret the data or give a diagnosis. And then the machine can also compare it to all these different <coughs> other diagnoses and over time be able to suggest, not tell you, but suggest that it could be precancerous or there's already a tumor there. And 
this machine is really cool because it makes the best use of humans and the best use of technology. You still have to get the 3D tissue sample, but it also has access to all these other brains in the system that are processing something in reality, saying, did this actually become cancer or not? This is um, a magazine called The Drum, and they said, we have an artificially intelligent automated issue. And I said, bullshit. <laughs> and I said, no way, this is not true. Um, but what they did is they had this kind of assistant that was kind of machine-like that would make suggestions to article length, picture size, fonts, caption length, and placement on a page. And with that, they were able to make a really nice readable magazine. This issue I was actually able to read cover to cover because the machines were actually saying, you know, this is, this is a nice length for this article. Or like, in the past, people have read these articles of these lengths, and therefore you should have this topic be this length instead of this length. And it was able to inform people instead of write the magazine. If you actually try to find an artificially intelligent magazine or book, they're horrible. They're totally unreadable. There is a, a film that you can watch called Mindspring, written by G Ross Goodwin, which he compresses together all of the science fiction screenplays, and then the main character from Silicon Valley acts it out, tries to make meaning out of it. The actors are really good, but it's still horrible, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. This is the sleep cycle tracker application. So you put your phone in airplane <coughs> mode, put it under your pillow, and it tracks your movement, and then it can tell whether you're in deep sleep or light sleep. So this is an example. All the low peaks are when I'm in deep sleep, and then the high peak is the natural time in which I could wake up if I wanted to. And what it does is it wakes you up before you go back into deep sleep. So oftentimes when you wake up in the morning and you're really groggy, it's because your alarm interrupted you in a deep sleep cycle, and so you wake up without having that next cycle. So this will monitor and wake you up before you go back into that deep sleep cycle, at the optimum time you should be waking up. It's making something visual that shouldn't be visual. And also, you don't want to track your sleep while you're asleep. It's a really good candidate for like, a machine to do that work and to give you the trend data over time. So you can see, like, you can put in, um, I walked for you know, 10,000 steps. And that actually, if I just say took a walk, like that's 20% more likely, or sorry, I get 20% better sleep if I walk 10,000 steps per day. So I try to walk 10,000 steps just so I can get better sleep. But I can now correlate that because the app will show me data over time. And that's something that humans aren't really good at either. We live our life one day at a time, we get caught up in these tiny little things, and if we store a little bit of that data outside of ourselves, we can get that feedback in a way that we can say, oh, that's interesting. I understand that now, or like, hmm, I didn't know that that was the thing. But usually it's just by showing somebody a graph, not giving them one sentence insights like a lot of these companies are trying to do. Technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. How many of you love disembodied computer voices talking at you all the time? That one guy. <laughs> um, this is an example of a project at Xerox Park under the, under the advisement of Mark Weiser. Natalie Germanjenko was an artist, and she said, what happens if you take a bunch of plastic string, attach it to a motor from the ceiling in the office, and then attach that to the servers? So anytime something interesting went on on the servers, this piece of plastic string would kind of wave around and make a lot of noise. And what would happen, right? So what happened was people realized that something was going on on the servers in the company, and they went, and they looked for where the person was. Everybody wore active badges, so you could see where they were in the company, so you could actually see everybody like gathering in somebody's desk. Um, and it was this really exciting thing, because suddenly you had a reason to go to somebody else's department in the company when it wasn't their birthday. Like, oftentimes <laughs> you just get stuck in your department. And so this was a really good way to exchange ideas in the company. This is kind of like a virtual, um, like a virtual water cooler to stand around. But then the Roomba, the Roomba, one of the reasons why it's successful is because it does, it's not a bot that looks like this, like a human and has a vacuum cleaner. It's just, it's basically a trilobite, right? It's a tiny little filter feeder. It's a prehistoric shape. People love it even though it doesn't clean any of the corners in your house. It's completely useless. But when it's done, it goes da da da. And when it's, <laughs> it's great. Like, why do we like R2-D2 and hate C-3PO? Because R2-D2 just 
computes and beeps, and it's cute, and you can kind of tell. It's like, it's like, oh no, R two D two is sad. Oh, you know. And then C three PO is like, I speak twenty thousand different languages, and it's like, yeah, well, you are really. It doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> I don't really like you at all. And so the robot, you know, with the Roomba is like, if it gets stuck, it goes dun dun, you know, and you're like, oh no, and you can go pick it up, and you can move it, and it's like da 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 da, you know, and then it goes and finds its dock. And this thing is not doing a great job the entire time. I'm cleaning your rug, by the way. It's like, you know, like running into things. And then your cat's all excited about it and riding around on it, and you make a YouTube video. But the reason why this thing is adorable, how many of you had like pocket pets, like pocket monsters, like Tamagotchis? Yeah, so those, why are those cute? Because instead of the technology trying to do something for us, we have to take care of it. It's not even real. We have to take care of our Roombas, and we have to take care of our phones and feed them when they get hungry and they cry and we have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep. And, and our Roombas are kind of the same because they're adorable little objects that communicate the least amount of information to get the point across, which is just a status tone and a light. There's so much emotion you can put into a tiny little sonic tone. So uh, there, was a, there was a Swedish developer that said, I have all these kids and they won't put their shoes on the shoe rack. And so she said, I'll make an emotive shoe rack. So can you imagine what the shoe rack does? It's just kind of depressed if you don't have any shoes on it. And the more shoes you put on the shoe rack, the happier it becomes. <coughs> it's not a real, op it's not real. But man, did these kids, they were like, oh my gosh, this shoe rack is so sad. We have to put the shoes on the shoe rack, right? And so this is like effective computing, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. Effective computing, emotive computing, is not putting some stupid voice in there that you then have to translate to like 60 different languages if you have to roll that out internationally. It's just a tone, and it's universal. It's why those Pixar films, like the little film before the Pixar movie is so great, because you don't have to have any words at all to get something universal across. This is something I want to see a lot more of. You can do so much more with this, and there are very few examples of where people have actually done it, because our default in a company, especially because of movies, movies really trick us, is to just use a human voice with everything. Computer, do da 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 It's like, no, 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 that's dumb. Like, the computer's always gonna get it wrong. Um, so, I like the Roomba, if you could tell. <laughs> Technology should consider social norms. What is a social norm? Well, a social norm is what is currently invisible. So everybody has a video camera in your pocket. Everybody in this room, pretty much. If you have a mobile phone, you've got a video camera. But 15 years ago, having a camera or a video camera in your pocket was crazy. Privacy is dead. No, everybody's gonna take pictures of each other. We can't put this in locker rooms. Nobody can be trusted with this. And in Japan, if you try to take a picture, it actually has a sound that you can't turn off because they've had problems with that. But now we know people take pictures of their food as part of a pre-digestive ritual so that it tastes better and looks good on Instagram. Like, we don't actually you know, invade everybody's privacy that much with the images. So it took a while. There's a kind of metabolism rate for humans to accept new technology and new features. And with phones, we already had the landline phone, then we had the cordless phone, which was the first time you could lose a phone, which is a really bizarre concept. And then the phone got unleashed from the house and got into our pockets somehow. And then we had, the f we had a camera on it, and then we had GPS on it. There was a very like, long trend, and it took a while, but then it became the norm that when you hold your phone up, you're taking a picture. So if you don't want to be in the picture, run away. You have at least like a few seconds to do so. Anything below that norm, that current norm that we have right now, is restorative. Eyeglasses are restorative. They restore you to the accepted norm of 20-20 vision, uh, and they can also be decorative. So it's okay, or a prosthetic leg or something like that. These, these are things that are restoring devices. But where tech goes wrong is when you release something with too many features, and it becomes enhancing and fear-inducing, because not everybody can have it. So this was the example of Google Glass, is that you have something where too many features were released at the same time. It was not built on something that anybody else had really tried before, except for eyeglasses, and it failed, and you could predict that it would fail uh, because of that. So when the smartphone camera came out, um, and when Google Glass came out, you could kind of tell, like, <coughs> if you look at the iPhone launch, for instance, like, 
it was an existing system of a phone, and then we were taught that you could make apps, and the best app for that system, I think, was the fart app. It just allowed you to press a button and it made a fart noise. <laughs> That's it. But what, what is so special about that application? Well, it shows you that in like 10 lines of code, it shows you how to use the audio library for the application, it shows you how to use the touch library, and it shows you how to put it in the store and put some graphics on it. So any 14-year-old could make a fart app. It was hilarious. Um, and people talked about it because it was playful. But the Google Glass, what were the apps that people made? It was Blink to take a photo. Eek, that's horrifying, right? And because there were so many features that, that happened, um, people just focused on the scariest one, which was persistent video recording, without understanding that you only have 15 minutes of battery life on your phone if you want to do persistent video recording. So the right amount of tech is the minimum to solve the problem. This is really hard to do because often your bosses and managers will say, let's just add all these new features. But each feature takes a season, just like clothing does, to get a part of your human experience. Like at least a season or a year or two years. And Apple started innovating with their iPod. They innovated through your ears. They said, ah, oh, well, we can just stuff something so that you can play something in your ears. But the whole point was to get a multi-touch interface that was cheap enough that you could turn it into a phone. This is like a 15-year strategy. This is incredible. But oftentimes people say, well, let's just make something new and everybody will like it without understanding that every single feature you do requires a lot of time to create, a lot of time to maintain, complicates your support process and makes everything more expensive. And then when a competitor comes out with less features that is better done, they'll usually beat you entirely. This is really hard to explain to managers. It's really easy to explain to designers and developers, but usually they're managed by somebody who doesn't necessarily know any of this, and that's the real friction that we're going to have that we already have right now. That's why we get things like Siri, where everybody says, this is the perfect thing and it will always understand you. And the developers behind the scenes are saying, no, it's not, it's not that great. Don't tell anyone that it's really great, because it's not. And then the marketers are like, it's the best thing ever. It will understand everything. And then you get in and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing is horrible. Oh, but then the marketer said it's really good again, so I'm going to download the new version. Like, what the heck? There's this giant disconnect. And it's a big mess, and it's going to be an even larger mess when we have humans reliant on Internet of Things that could have horribly disastrous consequences in terms of security, which we're already kind of seeing. These are my favorite technologies. Streetlights are really boring. They're just a light. And they're punctuation for your road. And then the toilet occupied sign on the airplane, even if you're red, green, colorblind, you can understand what it is. It's a pictogram. It's really straightforward. We don't talk about these technologies, but they're used everywhere. They're ubiquitous. And they're boring. Make boring technology. There should be, there should be a reward for making boring stuff because it's ubiquitous. And honestly, whenever I find boring companies on the outside, they have the most interesting groups of people. And when I go to like a really great brand name company that's really hot, like it's kind of a mess inside, honestly. I would rather work for the boring company that does something really well over a long period of time than something that's just a flash in the pan. Although working at one of those flash in the pan companies is probably really good so you can get it on your resume so that you have more clout and more uh, salary that you can get from the boring company. So maybe work in the flash in the pan just a little bit. Just, you know, it's good, good to do. Uh, technology should make use of the near and the far. So this is one of the like more futuristic slides. Okay, so <coughs> I'll explain this. So we had mainframe technology that was far away from us. Like Bill Gates used to sneak out of his house at three in the morning so that he could go use his timeshare slot on the mainframe computer, like in Washington. He was like, oh my gosh, I have to go and get this computer time. You didn't have access to all of the time and things were far away from you. Again, it was many people to one computer. Then we got near to us the desktop computer. And desktop was really incredible, even though everything was stored offline because there wasn't connectivity online yet, you would get CD-ROMs and you would install software. And the, the way that you had to make software was, you better make the software really good because somebody's going to have it on their computer for one or two years and you can't send them an update. So you better finish it. Then we went up to what I call remote mainframes or the cloud, where again, we're time sharing on somebody else's computer that we can't even touch or see. Do you even know where your Facebook photos are stored? A lot of them are stored like next to a, a giant river for the hydroelectric power somewhere in Eastern Washington. And if you go into that server facility, which I've tried, 
and say, my photos are here, can I have them? Can I see what server they're stored on? They'll be like, ah, <laughs> like, they'll, they'll really like kick you out. They'll be like, no, this is not cool, you can't be in here. It's like, but my data's in here, and they're like, you can't access your data. So what I wanna see happen is, we have really, really powerful computers in our pockets. Wouldn't it be great if we had our own personal servers where like, we could also serve data as well as collect it? So if you're trying to stream Game of Thrones on Netflix, you're not just relying entirely on the cloud to get that data, but you're also relying on other people's data on their phones and having collection of it, just kind of like Napster and file sharing, so that you get less bandwidth from the parent company, it's cheaper for you, and also it's faster and you have higher quality information or at least have a personal data server in your house that has all of your health information. So that every time you go to a doctor, all the information gets written to your file, and then you can portably take that around to different doctors or share that information with them for 24 hours for the pur purpose of diagnosing a disease, and then it's gone. So that way if somebody hacks, because they will, hacks into a main server, then they're only getting the data that was shared in the last 24 hours. Like it's kind of like flipping, like anytime you can kind of flip a thing and say, what happens if it's shared the other way? Then you can find weird solutions to things that are, that are more feasible. Because the problem with everything being stored in the cloud right now is it makes these data lakes that are really exciting for hackers. Because the more stuff that's put in the cloud, the more exciting it is to hack it. Like celebrity nude photos, that's a big thing to hack because the payoff is giant. And so if people are storing all the photos in the cloud, then they will be hacked. And depending on who you are, your data will be out there at some place. It's a really hard problem to solve right now. Hopefully we'll talk about solving it a little bit more in the future. So if you can process as much as possible on the device itself, then neat things can happen. How many of you, if you turned your phone to airplane mode, could do much with your phone at all? You can't do a lot if you just turn your phone to airplane mode. You can write in the notepad, you, can get, you can't even get a weather report. Like, yet, on a desktop computer in the past, we were able to do everything offline and it wasn't a big deal. How much we have changed over just a couple of years. Things, what we are doing right now is the norm, but it's not permanent, and it's okay to step outside of that and make different things. Like, we shouldn't just accept that and promote the same thing again and again and again. We can change it because it was changed before and it will be changed again. So if good design allows people to accomplish their goals in the least amount of moves, you take away steps until there's the least amount of moves to get to a goal, then Calm Technology allows you to do the same thing with the least amount of mental cost. And finally, what do we really want to optimize for? Are we optimizing for interesting moments in our lives, like having kids and eating food and watching a sunset? Or are we optimizing for a future in which we're getting lots and lots of alerts all of the time and we never have a free moment? Because I would like the future in which we are more human and have more time and amplify what's good about being a human versus trying to turn us all into computers that are constantly on repeat, trying to talk to a bunch of different connected systems that can't understand us with no human tech support in sight because we've automated everything and solved the problem. I wanna see more Roombas, hopefully. So finally, the quote from Mark Weiser, the scarce resource is not going to be technology. The scarce resource right now is our attention and how we design the future will make or break our relationship with ourselves, our ability to reflect, our ability to be on pause, and our ability to think that we're actually cool as humans instead of trying to turn ourselves into robots. Like, I don't want that future, and hopefully you don't want that future either. I wrote a book, it's called Calm Technology, it's on Amazon, it's all about this stuff. If you're a designer or a developer and you wanna know more, you can read it. Um, but if you don't want to read it, I have this website that has a bunch of original papers on it and a bunch of the Calm Technology principles and exercises. So you're free to look at that if you want. Thank you so much.